Good afternoon, and, and, and welcome. My name is Janice Welburn, for those of you who do not know me, and I have the distinct honor of serving as Dean of Libraries here at Marquette. Um, I want to thank you for braving the cold weather uh, to be here with us. There are some extra seats in the back, and there are a few in the front if, if you don't have them. For us, we think it's a good thing to have an overflow crowd. Um, I would like to also thank my colleague and my friend, Reverend Brian Massengill, for being here and agreeing to help us commemorate the late Martin Luther uh, King and his work. And Dr. William Welburn and I were having a dinner with uh, Dr. Massengill, and he was telling us about his course maybe a month or so ago, and we thought, oh, I want to have this program. Why don't you come and speak about this? And so we're so delighted that he was able to do so. While Martin Luther King Day was yesterday, the official day was yesterday, this April will mark the 50th anniversary of one of his most important writings, Letters from a Birmingham Jail. And Dr. Massengill selected this title, but what he did not know, that is my favorite piece, and I think one of the most important pieces written by Ma Dr. King, but also underutilized and, and read by others. Um, so I think it's, it, it's fitting that we'll focus on this document and that Dr. Uh, Massengill will talk about it today. I also want to tell you that some of you have read this for us as the library. We are launching what we hope will be an annual event and celebration of doc, Dr. Martin Luther King holiday that we'll have an annual lecture series. For some of you who read that it might be the Dr. Massengill lecture series, I guess that means we, he'll be back. Oh. But nevertheless, this is something that in the library that we've been hoping to do for some time now, and we're glad that it actually came. I think given in addition to, th this is such a historic moment because not only is it the 50th anniversary of Letters from a Birmingham Jail, as you know, this is the 150th anniversary of the Emancip Emancipation Proclamation. And yesterday we made history with the inauguration of President uh, um, uh, Barack Obama and for his second term, but again, history as the first president of color, but not to be the last. Um, so what we have today, so as we do this year-long celebration, we think that this will help us kick off the spring semester. But I want to introduce to you Dr. William Welburn, our um, Associate Provost uh, for Diversity and Inclusion, and he will introduce Dr. Massengill, but Dr. Welburn is also a co-sponsor of this event, and the refreshments that are out front are complimentary of Dr. Welburn's office, so I encourage you to partake. This is wonderful to do this, uh, to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Massengill. Uh, I, uh, what uh, Dean Welburn didn't mention is that part of the reason I think she likes the letter from the Birmingham jail so much is that she's from Birmingham. And uh, this is uh, living history to her. Um, so uh, on a recent trip to Birmingham, Alabama, I had the chance to revisit the city's civil rights district. For those of you who've been there, you know that walking through Kelly Ingram Park is an extraordinary reminder of those days in 1963 when all things came to a head. There's James Drake's gruesome sculpture, Police and Dog Attack, which you walk between three-dimensional images of attacking German shepherds held back by their leashes. The statue of Reverends N.H. Smith, A.D. King, and John Porter kneeling on Palm Sunday in prayer for their jail brothers and sisters. And the statue of Dr. Martin Luther King gazing out toward the 16th Street Baptist Church, site of the September 60, 1963 bombing that killed four girls attending Sunday school. That day I also stumbled upon an exhibit of the paintings of Norman Rockwell that included Blood Brothers, painted in 1968 
as a gruesome depiction of two murdered men, one black, one white, presumably King and Robert Kennedy. Birmingham is a city that still wrestles with its own past. 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, which we are celebrating the sesquicentennial this year, Birmingham was at the center of a storm over racial justice. Dr. King will reflect on this in his book, Why We Can't Wait, which has become a primer for activism on race, gender, sexuality, and disability. But it is the letter from the Birmingham jail that best captures the mood of the time, yet holds an enduring message. So we are honored this afternoon to have Reverend Brian Massengell, Doctor of Sacred Theology, to talk about the significance of the letter on its 50th anniversary. I can think of no one more appropriate than Dr. Massengell to inaugurate what we hope to be an annual lecture here at Marquette. Like Dr. Martin Luther King, Dr. Massengell's words have caused us to question the casualness of our faith in the face of pressing needs for social and racial justice and an end to our indifference on poverty, inequality, and oppression found across many dimensions of our society. A social ethicist, Dr. Massengel, has been prolific in his writings and presentations on these issues. His 2010 book, Racial Justice in the Catholic Church, is essential reading for all of us, regardless of which faith community we belong. Because again, like Dr. King, he has woven together a profound personal narrative with a theological analysis of some of the most significant issues facing our society today around racial inequality, poverty, and the call for social justice. Dr. Massengel is past convener of the Black Catholic Theological Symposium, which he brought to Marquette in the fall of 2011, and is the former president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. He serves on the editorial boards of several major journals in his field, and as a member of the North American <coughs> Regional Committee of the Catholic Theological Ethics in the World Church Project. He has received two honorary doctorates, and was the Bernard J. Hanley Chair at Santa Clara University. And I'm glad you're back. <laughs> Here at Marquette, his teaching on ethics, racial justice, and sexuality, and the Catholic Church are well known to students as he challenges them to think critically about their own futures in a troubled world. I will have one more thing. Dr. Massengel does not shy away from controversial questions. <laughs> he is an important voice not only here in Milwaukee, but among national and international networks of Catholic theologians. <clears throat> like Dr. King, he is the voice that some may try not to hear, but all will have to reckon with. And we are better for that. Dr. Massengel. Thank you, William. Wow, that was an extraordinarily generous introduction. Is this microphone on? It's working? You can hear me in the back there, too? Okay, I'm not, I'm not forgetting about you, so I'm, I, we're conscious of you back there, okay? Good. I want to thank Dean Welburn and Associate Provost Welburn for their invitation to speak today as Marquette honors not only the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, but also considers the implications of the still unfinished work of justice and equality for which he labored. I also want to thank my colleagues from the Department of Theology, whom I see are here, very generous representation. Also, some former students of mine are also here. I guess they just can't get enough, or I wasn't hard enough for them. Or they can at least, lex they can at least listen to a lecture they don't have to have an exam for. So. I've chosen to mark our remembrance here at Marquette of Dr. King's life and legacy through considering one of his most famous essays, Letter from a Birmingham City Jail. There are two reasons for this choice. 
First, the letter is one of King's most anthologized and widely published works, appearing in hundreds of college texts, including the one used in Marquette's Introduction to Theology course, Theo 1001. And as such, it is one essay that at least in theory, okay, good, okay, that at least in theory, every student at Marquette is obliged to at least lay eyes upon at least sometime during their time here. I'm not going to ask whether they've grappled with it or remember it, but at least they've laid eyes upon it at least once during their time here. Second, 2003 celebrates the 50th anniversary of this letter of writing. Anniversary years are times for remembering not only pivotal events of the past, but also for pondering their significance for the present. Thus, in this lecture, I don't want to simply recall King's document and lift up its major themes. I also want to ponder its continuing relevance today. For that's the difference between an artifact and a classic. An artifact is a time-bound piece studied principally to gain insight into a past period and the people that it represents. A classic, on the other hand, has a timeless quality and speaks not only for its time and place, but contains an enduring message and challenge that both haunts and inspires across generations and locations. I believe that King's letter is such an enduring document that commands our attention, and thus I hope to illumine its message for us today. So before we go into the letter itself, let's consider some background. I teach a class here at Marquette called Martin, Malcolm, Baldwin, and the Church, and the first two weeks of the class are simply teaching history, because many of our students have a very vague and very inadequate idea of the period we call Jim Crow America. So let's give you a warp drive introduction or overview to, that's right, I'm a Trekkie, by the way, a warp drive overview to Jim Crow America. 1963 was an ugly and brutal time in America. The nation was locked in a bitter struggle for its very soul, as King often said, as it wrestled with the question of whether to continue the practices of Jim Crow. It is important to briefly recall that Jim Crow was not merely the practice of racial segregation, as manifested in racially separate schools, restaurants, buses, trains, hotels, hospitals, and drinking fountains, as is sometimes told in our often sanitized presentations of history. That also leads us to believe that the Civil Rights Movement was simply about increasing opportunities for interracial mixing, again, as we too often are led to think. Jim Crow was this, but far more. Jim Crow was a regime of non-white humiliation and white supremacy, where every public law, social custom, and daily practice reminded one of one's assigned place in the racial caste system. That is, this was a comprehensive regime of state-sanctioned racism, what King himself once described as a police state of white tyranny, enforced not only by law, but by the ever-present fear and reality of sadistic violence. You see here a picture, one of many, of gruesome lynchings, and this is not indeed the most gruesome one could show. It shows quite, quite obviously that Jim Crow was enforced not only by law, but by the real threat of extrajudicial mob violence. Sadistic rituals of torture that were used not only to humiliate, but to send a message of what would happen if you dare to transgress the racial order that was deemed, in some cases, to be divinely ordained. Now, 1963 was a pivotal year in a struggle against this seemingly ironclad and impervious system of racial injustice. African Americans rose up in an unprecedented movement of massive protest and agitation, which was met by an equally determined white resistance, 
intent upon protecting a way of life that conferred an equal privilege and opportunity. This was the year of Medgar Evers' assassination, a civil rights leader and organizer who integrated the University of Mississippi. His assassination was a harsh reminder, if any was needed, of both the certain risks that were endured by those who challenged the prevailing social customs and the dire measures that many would employ to ensure its continuation. Now the Birmingham campaign of May, April, May 1963 occurred in this atmosphere of racial tension and terror. While portrayed as a challenge to the city's ironclad racial segregation, the concrete goals of the campaign appear rather modest to, contemporary, to a contemporary audience. The goals of the campaign were these. The removal of humiliating segregation signs on restrooms and, and drinking fountains in the city's business district. The desegregation of lunch counters in the city's commercial center and a plan to enhance black employment in downtown businesses. Very modest goals. Yet such proposals were taken as a dire threat to the Southern and indeed the American way of life. And thus their advocates were met with stiff and recalcitrant opposition as portrayed on these iconic images of hoses, dogs, and mass arrests. In the midst of this campaign, April 12, 1963, saw a strange confluence of events. On that day, King was arrested for leading a peaceful protest march in defiance of a court injunction issued two days prior against such peaceful demonstrations. This order by the Alabama State Court was intended to halt these marches and sit-in protests that paralyzed the business community. Now King realized that disobeying this court order was controversial, but he felt a moral obligation not to comply with what he deemed an abuse of the judicial process to subvert constitutional rights to the end of defending immoral laws. He declared, we cannot in all good conscience obey such an injunction, which is an unjust, undemocratic, and unconstitutional misuse of the legal process. Thus King was arrested, placed in a narrow, austere jail cell, and imprisoned in solitary confinement for eight days. What you see here is a representation of the jail cell in one of the uh, King, King Museums. An historian provides this description of his confinement. The 54 square foot isolation cell had only a few scant furnishings for King. A six foot cot with metal slats and no mattress, a sink, a toilet, a metallic, a metallic mirror on the back wall, and no overhead light. The burden of absolute solitude greatly distressed King and sent him, into a descending, sent him descending into a period of deep depression. The civil rights leader later recalled these hours as the most frustrating and bewildering he had ever lived. Later, he wrote a book to talking about the Birmingham experience entitled, Why We Can't Wait. And in that book, he gives a personal account of the conditions of his cell. And I'll quote him. I suffered no physical brutality at the hands of my jailers, which is significant because oftentimes civil rights protesters were tortured during their imprisonment. Some of the prison personnel were surly and abusive, but that was to be expected in southern prisons. Solitary confinement, however, was brutal enough. In the mornings, the sun would rise, sending shafts of light through the window high in the narrow cell, which was my home. You will never know the meaning of utter darkness until you have lain in such a dungeon, knowing that sunlight is streaming overhead and still seeing only darkness below. 
So April 12, 1963, King is imprisoned. Now at some point during his imprisonment, we're not exactly sure when, King became aware of a statement issued by eight prominent white clergy leaders in Birmingham on the day of his arrest. While predominantly Protestant, the group also included a Catholic bishop and a Jewish rabbi. These men were moderates by the standards of the time. They were not necessarily in favor of racial integration, but they realized that changes in the mores and customs of the South were perhaps inevitable. They advocated decent and courteous treatment for Birmingham's black residents, yet insisted that any racial changes should be done gradually for the sake of social peace. In the words of one observer, the distinguishing feature of all moderates was their support for gradual accommodation of the South to new ways of thought and behavior. Thus they consoled patience on the part of those seeking social change. They were also emphatic that laws and court decisions should be obeyed by both black and white. So by definition, the moderates positioned themselves between the forces of diehard segregation on the one hand and those of proactive engagement on the other. That is between activist integrationists who demanded freedom now and defiant segregations who segregationists who responded with never. To both groups, but especially to the integrationists, the moderates' response was wait. White racial moderates occupied a precarious demilitarized zone between these two positions, viewing both as forms of unacceptable extremism, note that word will be important later, that inevitably, inevitably would lead to violence, upheaval, and anarchy. Now giving these commitments, the tone and content of the white spiritual leader's statement was predictable. Published in the leading Birmingham newspaper, these ministers criticized King's demonstrations as being, quote, unwise and untimely, unquote contending that nonviolent marches and sit-ins, however technically peaceful, precipitated, quote, hatred and violence, they advocated instead patient and calm negotiations as the best avenue for success. Moreover, they voiced suspicion at the current controversies as being unduly influenced by outsiders, people like King who, quote, lacked knowledge and experience of our local situation, unquote. They concluded by praising the calm restraint of the local police in the face of the demonstrators and urged the black Birmingham community to withdraw support from King's movement and instead to press their case in the courts and through negotiations and, as I said, not in the streets. They declared that both blacks and whites in this difficult hour needed to, quote, observe principles of law and order and common sense, unquote. In sum, the moderates argued for time, time for better education, more persuasion, more debate, and better laws. They counseled patience and forbearance from the black community, encouraging them to wait for a more convenient season to press their understandable demands. Demands they said were understandable, but which they never characterized as being just or legitimate. These moderates were committed to racial progress and to a measure of justice as long as it could be obtained with respect for order, due process, and good manners, as befits Southern gentlemen of good upbringing, and above all else, at a pace dictated by the comfort of the white majority. All of this provides the context for understanding King's letter, written in response to the challenges of the moderates.
The circumstances of the letter's composition account in part for its authority and claim to attention. King relates that he began to compose it in his prison cell during the hours of daylight available to him, writing first in the margins of a newspaper, then on scraps of paper smuggled to him by a friendly prison worker, and then on a pad of paper his attorneys were permitted to give him. These scraps, it was then said, were smuggled out of the jail cell by his attorneys and conveyed to a secretary who transcribed King's handwriting into a typewritten manuscript. It was begun on April 12, 1963, the day of his arrest, the day the statement was issued, a day which also happened to be Good Friday, which contributes to the lore of the letter, the day when Christians recall Jesus' own imprisonment and condemnation for the sake of justice. The image of King offering the document while in solitary confinement for the sake of the gospel, like the Apostle Paul, accounts in part for its enduring appeal. And so you see one of the classic representations of King in a solitary cell, writing, scribbling in day by daylight, and also King sitting behind a cross. The juxtaposition of being in solitary confinement on Good Friday for the sake of the gospel is part of the reason for the letter's continuing claim to attention. Yet, it is also important to note that the letter as we know it today was neither a haphazard composition nor was it entirely spontaneous. First, King relates that while the substance of what he composed in that jail cell remained unaltered, he admits that he did polish it and amplify it for, wide, for more widespread <coughs> dissemination. However, more importantly, King had long entertained the idea of responding publicly to the criticisms he received from members of the white clergy and rebuking the lax response of the white church to the challenge of justice. On several occasions, he did criticize religious leaders for both their complicity in vocally, def in vocally defending segregation as God's will and or their permissive silence in the face of blatant racial injustice. We don't have time to go into it now, but then during a course, I, a course I teach, I go into looking at some of the detailed biblical justifications that we're using to defend racial segregation and showing its congruence with the will of God. King himself was, of course, adamantly opposed to this, but even more he was opposed to those white leaders who, although they didn't defend segregation biblically, were, did not oppose it out of fear. Three months earlier, in fact, King had delivered a little noted speech entitled, Challenge to the Churches and Synagogues, in which he advanced some of the themes found in the Birmingham letter, including a justification for the civil rights movement, disappointment with white clergy, and defending the urgency of now. What distinguishes the letter, then, is not the novelty of its themes, but rather the place of its origin and, the, and its character as a direct response to a specific challenge from respected religious authorities. Now, the letter itself is a wonderfully complex document and a masterful composition. And so there are any number of ways of lifting up its themes for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to lift up three themes from the letter that give us an understanding of its content. First, the letter has an extensive defense of civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance. One finds in the letter a critique of gradualism, rooted in its misunderstanding of social reality and its lack of empathy for the victims of injustice. And finally, King has a criticism of, in, of inadequate understandings of religious faith and the demands of authentic discipleship. So let's go to the first theme, the one I'm going to treat more briefly for reasons I'm going to explain later. The Birmingham letter is often regarded today as a kind of magna carta for civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance. And this is not at all untrue. 
King provides a masterful justification for nonviolent protest and the breaking of unjust laws. Weaving a tapestry out of threads taken from Christian theology, citing Augustine and Aquinas on the nature of just laws, Judeo-Christian faith, appealing to the disobedience of the Old Testament's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and American history and recent experience, citing Jefferson, Thoreau, resistance to Hitler, and opposition to communist tyranny. But I argue that a preoccupation with this dimension of the letter, which is the easiest perhaps to teach, obscures other equally important aspects that receive less attention. In my reading, King wants to go underneath the moderate clergy's letter and expose why the stance of gradualism is so lacking, problematic, and even immoral. King advances two reasons. The first is that their understanding of social reality is fundamentally flawed and that flawed understanding of reality is due to a lack of empathetic response with the plight of the oppressed. King chastises the ministers for their overconfidence in the power of reasoned persuasion and for having an irrational belief that the mere passage of time leads inexorably to some desired outcome. King believed that such convictions were socially naive and dangerous because they ignore the recalcitrance of the privileged. Practically, King argued, privileged groups seldom surrender their advantage status voluntarily and without a coercive demand. He wrote, my friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in the civil rights movement without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. He continues, history is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. The moderates, by their insistence on gentility and good manners, rendered themselves socially impotent and ineffective, and thus sabotaged efforts to transform an unjust social order. In contrast, King argued that human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable, but requires the tireless, dogged, and persistent efforts of those, he said, quote, were willing to be co-workers with God, unquote. For without hard work, Keen warned, quote, time becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation, unquote. But King sharpened his criticisms of the moderates by contending that such flawed understanding and effective social practice stemmed from a lack of empathy with the plight of the oppressed. After observing that African Americans had waited for 340 years for their freedom, he states that it is easy for those who have never experienced systemic injustice to counsel unending patience and to wait. He then provides what has become a classic expose of the daily trials and humiliations of racial segregation, which is an appeal to an absent empathy. It's been called the most eloquent run-on sentence in the English language. Listen to its rhetorical force. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, 
when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son asking an agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take an un a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite, knew, quite knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outward resentments, then you will understand why we find it so difficult to wait. In sum, King states that racial moderation and gradualism stem from a lack of empathetic understanding of the real evil of racial injustice and the harm it does to its victims. The absence of empathy leads to an incomprehension of the urgency of now. The third theme in the letter that I wish to raise up for us is that King finds racial gradualism and moderation problematic and immoral because they betray an inadequate understanding of religious faith and the demands of Christian discipleship. We cannot lose fact that although this was an open letter addressed to all Americans, King addresses it primarily to, quote, my fellow clergymen, unquote. A significant feature of the letter is that it is an extended argument over the role of religion in the pursuit of justice. King develops an impassioned indictment of any form of religion that serves as a justification for the social status quo. While he excoriates white ministers who opposed the movement for racial justice, he leveled his harshest critique at those who kept a timid silence and preferred to hide what he called behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. In other words, what we see in the letter, King draws a clash between two different forms of Christianity symbolized by the two pictures that you see before you. On one would be a typical kind of comfortable, kind of quasi-suburban church with its own stained glass windows. And on the other is the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, that was bombed in August of 1963 with its stained glass windows blown out. And King is constantly drawing a contrast in the later part of his letter between two different understandings of Christianity and Christian faith. Indeed, he accused the church of lagging behind other social institutions in the quest for a more just society. He writes, in the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white ch churches stand on the sideline and merely mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. So here we are moving to the exit of the 20th century with a religious community largely adjusted to the status quo, standing as a tail light behind other community agencies rather than as a headlight 
leading men and women to higher levels of justice, close quote. And I noticed that some of my former students are smiling because the distinction between headlight and tail light was an important thing they had to memorize for the course. Yes, that they remember it gives warms my heart. Now King continued to press the case against white moderation, going so far as to charge that silence and timidity in the face of injustice revealed a faith community in the grip of an idolatrous false god. Remarking on the impressive and ubiquitous church edifices found throughout the South, King stated, and I quote here, over and over again I have found myself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Where were their voices of support when tired, bruised, and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of the complacency to the bright hills of creative protest? In other words, King is alleging that deficient social praxis stems from inadequate theological understandings of both church and God. Thus King argued that racial moderates and advocates of gradualism by compromising with the demands of justice for the sake of social respectability and peace betrayed their own prophetic heritage and risked the rejection of many out of disgust with their hypocrisy. He says, I am meeting young people every day whose disappointment with the church has risen to outright disgust, unquote. Social complacency in the face of injustice stems from a false concept of God and a severely compromised understanding of the demands of authentic religious faith. In a remarkable moment of candor, King wondered whether organized religion is even capable of developing the kind of authentic faith that would keep it from becoming what he called, quote, an irrelevant social club, unquote, and making fatal compromises for the sake of social gain. He thought perhaps it would only be a small leaven, the inner spiritual church, that is the hope for authentic faith witness in the face of unjust social systems. Thus, in the letter from Birmingham City Jail, King reveals an acute mind wedded to a profound faith. In an act of religious imagination, King styled himself as a 20th century apostle who, from his prison cell, addressed a deep challenge to both the nation and the church that he claimed as his own. Now, that was then, but this is now. Fifty years later, what does this document mean for us today? This is where it starts to get interesting, at least for me. I argued at the lecture's beginning that King's letter from Birmingham jail is not merely an historical artifact that sheds valuable light on an ugly period of American history. Rather, it has a continuing claim upon our attention even in a country vastly different than the circumstances that led to its composition. Who could have imagined in 1963 that one day Medgar Evers' widow would give the opening invocation at the inauguration of the president of the nation whose citizens killed her husband for her, his courageous witness against white supremacy? Also, no one would have dreamed in those dark and savage days of 1963 that 50 years later we would live in a nation that has twice elected to its highest office a dark-skinned man whose color made him ineligible to even vote in a plurality of states of the Union. Clearly, much has changed since 1963. These images would have been unthinkable 50 years ago. And yet I will argue that the letter endures as a lasting challenge for at least 
three reasons. The first is that through it, King reminds us of the distinction between legality and morality. To put it bluntly, just because something is legal doesn't make it right. And for that reason, questions concerning the distinction between just and unjust laws, the legitimacy of civil disobedience, and the recourse to nonviolent resistance will continue to haunt human societies. And for that reason, this letter has an enduring claim to attention. As you can see, even resisting fracking, is in, the movement is invoking King as an inspiration for its, for its cause. However, there is a second reason that King's letter has a classic resonance for the contemporary reader. Because in it, he provides both a haunting critique of enduring faults in organized religion and also a model of critical adult faith. Every day, I teach students at Marquette who embody what King foretold, namely, young people whose disappointment with the church has become outright disgust. Now, it is tempting for theology professors and religious ministers to regard such youthful dismissals of religion and faith as mere emotive stances uninformed by serious thought. It is also tempting to dismiss the dismissal of religion as an overreaction to an impoverished experience of early religious education and formation. After all, if they had me when they were growing up, they would love the church. <laughs> or so I tell myself. It's also tempting to even bemoan such attitudes as the pernicious effects of being formed in a secular milieu that marginalizes or is even hostile to religious sensibilities and convictions. King challenges us to consider another possibility, namely, that hostility toward organized religious faith stems from a crisis of the credibility of its institutional carriers. If young people tend to regard the church as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for contemporary life, then King would challenge the church to ask itself why. Now, in a magisterial study of King's concept of the church, Lewis Baldwin maintains that the church, Protestant, Catholic, and black, is in the midst of an unprecedented crisis of credibility. Recent surveys support this contention. Recent Gallup polls document a dramatic and unprecedented rise in non-church affiliation especially, but not only, among younger so-called millennial Americans. These are what we call the so-called nons. They have no faith affiliation or church membership. Other studies show a precipitous defection of white Catholics from that church, a rate so severe that former Catholics are now the country's fastest growing religious denomination. Finally, the Barna Group, a group which is largely sponsored from the evangelical uh, wing of the Christian faith, released a study showing the devastating views of younger Christians about their faith. Namely, the vast majority between the ages of 16 and 29 described the church using four adjectives, judgmental, intolerant, hypocritical, and homophobic. In a follow-up study, they noted that one-fifth, or 22% of young adults with a Christian background said, quote, the church is like a country club, only for insiders, unquote. Note the eerie echo of what King wrote in his letter, that the church was in danger of becoming an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Indeed, the Barna Group noted that so great is the disaffection of many younger Christians that they hesitate to publicly identify themselves as such, 
preferring to call themselves post-Christian or spiritual. Now, King is relevant today not merely because he foretold such a state of affairs, but also because in his letter he provides a concrete model of adult faith and critical belonging in the midst of such deep disappointment. He writes, In deep disappointment I have wept over the laxity of the church. But there can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. King is a concrete model for how deep disappointment and deep love for a flawed institution are not necessarily mutually exclusive options. He stands as a model for critical belonging and allegiance, even with flawed but religious bodies. He shows that questioning and critique of the church is a needed witness and a form of loyalty. For many of my students, I can relate, their, student, their study of King is the first time they've been given permission to consider alternative forms of faith engagement other than un, either uncritical allegiance or angry dismissal. And King's letter provides an enduring prophetic challenge to the church, namely a reminder that social respectability and access to power is no guarantee of religious integrity. Indeed, King would argue that these are temptations to apostasy that must always be resisted if the church is to be true to its founder and his claim to be present among the socially despised and culturally disdained. A final third reason that I will argue that King's letter is still relevant today is because of our continued embarrassed silences and denials over the nation's lingering racial injustice and dysfunction. As evidenced from the debate occurring during our recently concluded presidential election, race was a ubiquitous subtext in that election that could not be ignored, and yet many commentators did their best. A headline in a recent Milwaukee Journal Sentinel conveys what I mean. The headline was entitled, Segregation and a Tragic Silence. As the city suffers, it remains a non-topic. Indeed, in a major letter, uh, study of the letter from Birmingham City Jail, it provides this description of Birmingham's current racial climate. The author writes, An underlying bitterness and subtle animosity still seeps through the city as a lingering reminder of long years of racial separation. De jure segregation has been replaced by a de facto apartheid mentality by both races. Whites continue to push farther into suburbs and embrace the old us versus them mentality. Few in the city have the courage to pursue meaningful dialogue about mutual problems. Only a handful of interracial churches exist in the city, and blacks would be no more welcome in many areas white congregations than they would have been in 1963. The peace that Martin Luther King sought and the eight white clergy advocated has remained an elusive dream. Birmingham and Milwaukee are not isolated or unique in America. Yet we don't name this reality, and religion too often keeps silent about it, once again revealing itself to have what King called, quote, a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound, unquote, when it comes to race. Let me offer another anecdotal example. Last semester, I had my students in the Martin Luther King course write an essay giving the address that King would deliver to America on King Day 2013, in light of the, tra the trajectory of his thoughts and his enduring convictions. It pains me to say that the class did a remarkable job. 
with many students even imitating King's distinctive cadence and vocabulary in their papers. They endangered my coveted reputation as a tough grader. <laughs> many students, accurately I believed, related King to the cause for a greater LGBT inclusion and same-sex marriage. Others pointed to his likely opposition to and questioning of our military pursuits in Afghanistan and the Middle East. What was disappointing, however, is how few made any mention of racial tensions, the reality of racial disparity in incarceration and educational achievement, or even the ongoing existence of racial prejudice and its presence in the election campaign that was then underway in earnest. Now impressed on this in my experience, most students at Marquette respond by denying that racism is much of a factor in contemporary social life. And certainly they claim not at Marquette itself. I'm just reporting what I hear. Now, one such discussion was interrupted by a brave student who stated that such claims were bull excrement or some other colorful phrase. He then said, quote, I look Sicilian and everyone thinks I'm white, but my mother is black and my brother and sister are darker than I am. And I see how people here look at my family when they come to visit. And I hear what is often said about black people because people think I'm white. Racism is alive at Marquette. I know. It was one of those electrifying moments in the classroom when there was stunned silence both because he outed himself as a person of color and most of the white students were found out that there was a spy in their midst. <laughs> King, in his letter, reminds us that empathic understanding is a central key to a more racially just society. Joe Feagan, a prolific scholar on the sociology of white racism, notes that socialization in a culture of racism blunts one's ability to feel the pain of the oppressed. He calls this social alexithemia, that is, the sustained inability to relate to and understand the suffering of those who are oppressed. This is the basis for what some have called racially selective sympathy or indifference. That is the unconscious refusal to render to a racial minority the same care that one would extend to one's own. Or as Jesse Jackson more directly put it, quote, America has a high tolerance for black suffering and pain, unquote. Thus, in the age of Obama, today's racial moderates no longer say, wait. They ask, what more do you want? You've got the White House, problem solved. To which King would respond, only those who are in a position of privilege would find it easy to ask, what more do you want? And he would lift up stories of lives broken by incarceration for offenses for which whites go unjailed. He would lift up stories of children who go to bed hungry while their neighbors throw away food. Of schools with inadequate, outdated, and broken computers. While a few miles away, schools have an abundance of taken for granted digital resources. And he would lift up for us stories of hardworking parents black, brown, white, yellow, and red, who struggle not to let their children know that they may soon be without shelter. And then he would challenge us to see them as part of us. And King would then remind us that the asset test of authentic faith 
is our concern for what he called, quote, the father's suffering and helpless and outcast children, unquote. That solidarity is the measure of authentic faith. For these reasons, then, the continued ongoing need to discern just and unjust laws, the need to um, develop a credible understanding of Christian faith and witness amidst the continuing crisis of credibility of its institutional carriers, and the continuing relevance of poverty and racism today. For these reasons, King remains relevant. His letter remains relevant even today, 50 years later. In conclusion, perhaps the greatest contemporary witness that the letter from Birmingham City Jail leaves us with is that it is a concrete testament to one of King's enduring convictions. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. King's letter is an enduring witness of courage and faith under fire. It is a haunting reminder of the cost of keeping silent in the midst of injustice and is a witness to a life of faith-filled integrity that continues to inspire and haunt us long after his release from the narrow cell of solitary confinement. Thank you.